Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Tyndall. I am the executive director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, where our mission is to foster curiosity and a spirit of discovery in visitors of all ages, enhancing public understanding of and appreciation for the natural world, science, and human cultures. This mission in mind, I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to tonight's lecture, co-sponsored by the Harvard Museum of Natural History and the Collection of Historical Scientific Instruments. Tonight's featured scholar is Dr. Reed Gotchberg, who will discuss her recent book, Useful Objects, Museums, Science, and Literature in 19th Century America. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions anytime during the program. And at the end of the presentation, our speaker will address as many questions as time allows. It is now my pleasure to formally introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Reed Gotchberg is Assistant Director of Studies and a lecturer on history and literature at Harvard University. At Harvard, she has taught seminars and tutorials on museums in America museums and material culture, and science exploration and empire. Her research and teaching focus on, uh, focus on 19th century American literature and culture, with particular interest in material culture, museum studies, and the history of science and technology. Her book, which you, you will hear more about today, um, really examines the literary and cultural debates that surrounded the development of American museums during the 19th century. In addition, uh, Reed has served as a guest faculty curator um, for our online exhibition uh, that featured the history of women working at the Museum of Comparative Zoology in the late 19th century. Please welcome Reed Gotchberg to the Zoom stage. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture for having me today. Um, thank you so much, Brenda, for that lovely introduction and for being part of this conversation. Um, and I also want to thank um, Diana Munn and her colleagues in public programs for organizing this talk. Um, it's really a pleasure to have the chance to talk to all of you about my, my work and to think a little bit about how it fits into how we understand the history of museums here at Harvard and beyond. So I'm going to start with this image of an object from the Museum of Comparative Zoology collections. Um, this is a specimen of a turtle, but this particular specimen has its own strange and perhaps a little bit surprising history. Um, it was collected and donated to the museum by the writer and naturalist Henry David Thoreau. Best known for capturing his local environment and writing in Walden, Thoreau also captured nature in other forms, um, most notably this turtle. While living in his cabin at Walden Pond, Thoreau collected numerous specimens that are now here at the museum, but he was very conflicted about his actions. Writing in his journals a few years later, he noted with regret that he had killed it, quote, for the sake of science. He continued, I cannot excuse myself for this murder. This turtle presented both an ethical and a scientific dilemma. To observe the natural world around him, Thoreau depended on specimens like this one, but he also remained very wary about the process of preservation that allowed it to be relocated from Walden Pond to, to a natural history museum. So I'm especially interested in how Thoreau's turtle captures the intersecting worlds of writers, objects, and collections in the mid 19th century. His work as a specimen collector opens up various kinds of questions about the stories behind individual objects in museum collections. We can read this turtle alongside a major work of literature such as Walden. We can think about the many individuals who collected and donated objects to museums and their distinct motivations. We can also imagine the researchers and visitors who have encountered this turtle ever since. His reflections also help to open up broader questions about how and why objects are preserved within museum collections and also suggest how we can continue to see these collections in new ways. So every museum has a distinct and fascinating history and the history of collections broadly speaking can offer really important insights into how we understand the role of museums today. Part of what drew me to thinking about the period from the 18th through the 19th century was that it was a really major moment um, in when a lot of different museums were being established. And also this period of really enormous transition in terms of how both the founders of museums and their visitors were thinking about their value and purpose. Many were short-lived and their collections dispersed after a brief time. Some evolved into new kinds of institutions with a different focus today from their origins and some still exist today. Um, my work has focused, as Brenda mentioned, on the broader debates that surrounded these collections, and especially the reflections among writers, artists, and visitors. 
So these discussions often resemble the conversations that are ongoing at museums today about how objects are valued, about who will have access to knowledge and about the role of these institutions in society. One of the goals of my work has really been to think about how the longer histories of museums and the kinds of imaginative, creative and reflective discussions that surrounded them at an earlier moment can really inform how we think about making museums into more interdisciplinary, inclusive and community oriented spaces today. So I'll begin by speaking broadly about a few examples from the book of different 19th century museums, then I'll return to Thoreau's turtle in a little bit more detail, and then finally I'll conclude with some, uh, some ideas about how these discussions can inform our understanding of museums today. So although I'm going to focus on the 19th century, this was by no means the earliest moment in the history of museums and collections. Scholars commonly trace the history of museums back to early modern Europe when individual collectors created cabinets of curiosities filled with a wide range of fossils, natural history, specimens, artifacts, and other objects collected from voyages around the world. During the 18th century, collectors continued to be very interested in these kinds of objects, but they also became increasingly interested in developing representative collections. Um, there was this idea that within a single collection, you might create a world in miniature, you know, an encyclopedic collection that could allow for the study of all branches of knowledge. These individual collections would also form the basis of later public museums such as the British Museum. And around the same time, many royal collections of art were turned into public institutions such as the Louvre and National Gallery. So these institutions were really important models for the development of museums in the United States at this time. So between the late 18th and early 19th century, there's this really interesting period of transition. The, the late 19th century is when we see the founding of institutions such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the MFA in Boston, the American Natural History Museum in New York. But if we read forward from the 18th century through the 19th century, we can actually see that there's this very gradual, messy, non-linear process that takes us from this kind of cabinet of curiosities model in which a collection was filled with natural history specimens, antiquarian artifacts, technological models, um, prints, books, and all kinds of different things um, towards these more specialized collections. So if we think back for a moment to Thoreau's Turtle and its combined literary and scientific resonance, these collections were also ve quite varied in their scope and they brought together a lot of different kinds of objects. And there was also this very kind of uneasy balance between research, education and entertainment in terms of how their purpose was being imagined. So what can we learn from this period and, and why should we look at the, the prehistory of museums dedicated to science and culture? So first we can see how they were engaging a range of different questions about how to define the value of objects. Many museum founders were emphasizing this idea of useful knowledge, um, you know, really suggesting how material objects could, could kind of stand in as, as making knowledge itself more tangible and concrete. But you know, useful to whom, um, useful for whom, um, and also what about useless knowledge? Is there a place for that within these collections? So these founders often had very lofty goals about a broader mission of research and education, and they committed to preserving objects for posterity and promised a kind of democratic access to knowledge. Um, but you know, things obviously did not always play out this way. Um, one of the most important things that we can learn from this history is really this, an opportunity to account for and acknowledge the, the more troubling histories behind collections as well. Patterns of elitism and exclusion, theft and even violence, um, racism and colonialism, and how you know, often very limited audiences were able to engage with collections or claim authority. So I wanna highlight just a couple of examples from the book, um, just to give you a sense of the range and variety of co collections, but also to suggest some of the, the broader questions and challenges that they evoked. Um, much like visitors to one of these, these early cabinets, um, we will be thinking together about a bunch of different kinds of objects. We'll think about natural history specimens, anthropological artifacts, mechanical models, um, and perhaps not so coincidentally, um, these different collections also map onto the different collections under the umbrella here at HMSC. So first we can think about how and why museums preserve objects and for what. Um, as I noted before, a number of collections didn't survive for very long or they were dispersed elsewhere as museums shifted their purpose. 
So one example of this was actually at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, which kept a cabinet of artifacts alongside its, alongside its library. Um, so what would happen is that when objects were donated to the collections, they often were loaned out to members of the society in order to help them with their research. Um, this meant that they often got lost. Um, you know, members of the society often misplaced things. They didn't always return things. Um, the objects themselves were also not always very well preserved. Um, and so, you know, it's what's important to note about this is that this was actually a very common pattern among early museums. Um, techniques of preservation were nowhere near as good as the ones that continue to keep Thoreau's turtle um, preserved for us to look at. Um, but it also speaks to another way of thinking about the purpose of these collections, that they were meant to be touched, circulated, passed around. Um, they were meant to be used. And so, you know, this, the, the preservation was really less important than enabling access and enabling use of this collection. But, however, that access was also quite limited, and it tended to be restricted to communities of elite white men. This did not mean that others did not engage with museum collections, but it did create hierarchies of authority and expertise that often led to the erasure of other forms of knowledge, um, particularly those of Black and Indigenous communities. So throughout this period, many white collectors sought out Native American and Indigenous artifacts, and they often were participating in acts of theft or violence that were linked to the broader dispossession of native people from their land. But material objects were really central to the kinds of historical and cultural research that was being done by early ethnologists. But this process also cut across different fields and involved different kinds of collecting practices. You know, so one example of this is um, Henry Rose Schoolcraft, who was an author. He was a, an, a federal agent with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He participated in a number of different exploring expeditions. Um, he was actually married to a poet named Jane Johnston Schoolcraft, who was the daughter of an Ojibwe chief. And he worked with her and with her family to quote unquote collect folk tales and legends, um, describing them actually in very terms, very similar terms to his other collections as specimens. Um, and these kinds of moments show that the crossover between different kinds of collecting and different forms of objects, whether literature, visual culture, or, or material artifacts. So with the rise of public museums and the opening of galleries to broader audiences, museums also functioned as social spaces, but they also continued to reinforce hierarchies between experts and the public. Um, this was the case for Ora White Hitchcock, who was the wife of um, Amherst College professor of geology, Edward Hitchcock, um, and she was she was a really talented artist. She, as you can see here, produced a lot of the illustrations for his scientific publications, as well as you know, drawings that he used for his, his classroom slides. Um, but she, when touring museums with him in England and Scotland, was actually very reticent in terms of how she describes her own experiences when, within the galleries. You know, she spent hours within museums, you know, poring over these cases and cabinets of, of specimens and fossils. Um, but writing in her diary, she, she notes that she found herself thinking of Edward and how much he would benefit from them. And it's a really interesting moment for how we think about the role of women um, within the space of a museum. Um, and it also really invites us to think about the range of people who were engaging with museum collections, um, really thinking beyond what institutions were promising or claiming to offer, and also to think, see how they were reflecting on their own place within these galleries. So I've talked so far, far primarily about natural history and anthropology. Um, but one museum was also dedicated to new technology during this period. So here is the gallery of the US Patent Office. Um, this was a somewhat unexpected combination of different, um, different purposes during this period. Um, the Patent Office served not only as a bureaucratic wing of the federal government, but it also had this gallery that included you know, thousands of small miniature models that inventors submitted along with their patent applications. Um, they were required to submit these three-dimensional models during this period. Um, and you know, often they made them to be very eye-catching and very interesting to visitors. So as a result, this became a major tourist attraction. Um, that was the, the tourist attraction part was really helped by the fact that um, this gallery also housed the collections of the National Institute. Um, you know, these two collections are really seen as the precursor to the Smithsonian and actually the old patent office building now houses the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. 
Um, but what we can really see in this moment is how, you know, even at this moment that the museums are starting to become more specialized, starting to move towards, you know, natural history or art or technology, um, there's still this, this national museum that's combining all kinds of different collections together and really inviting, you know, visitors to think about, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, the order and chaos of the patent models and the National Institute, um, you know, in sort of wide ranging and more specialized collections, but also between, you know, research and education and entertainment. So these examples, I think, really help us to see how the idea of a museum was really in flux throughout this period, and it could take a lot of different forms. Um, these were wide ranging collections um, with their specimens, artifacts, models, and so forth, but they they also highlight the, the crisscrossing intersecting paths of objects and also the way that collections were bringing together a lot of different figures and institutions in conversation. These museums were also inviting creative and imaginative responses, especially among visitors who were reflecting on the purpose of these collections and their role within the galleries. Um, the founders of these institutions often envisioned a very orderly process and pictured collections neatly arranged in cases and cabinets. But the reality was a much more disorderly and dynamic process. The people within galleries were not just passive recipients and often challenged the principles and hierarchies within museums. And by thinking about these collections through their eyes, we can see how the objects resonated differently in different contexts. So with these broader issues in mind, let's come back to Thoreau's turtle. So what motivated him to collect specimens? How did he think about the kinds of scientific knowledge he was producing? And how do his writings help us better understand the early history of this museum? So as many of you may know, the Museum of Comparative Zoology has a very complicated and often very troubling early history. The museum was founded by Louis Agassi, who was one of the most famous naturalists of his day, but who is better known today for his work promoting scientific racism, including his efforts to document racial difference through photography. He was also well known for refusing to accept Charles Darwin's theories of evolution. So Agassi established the museum as a space for research and teaching, and he used his fame to attract many donations from amateur naturalists, such as Thoreau, in order to continue to build the collections. The title of the museum speaks to the method that he had in mind. By accumulating tons of specimens, scientists could compare them. The larger the collection, the more opportunities to study and catalog, he hoped, all of nature itself. But the vision that he had in mind of nature was fixed, hierarchical, and unchanging. His views on natural history were inseparable from the ways that he extended them to human beings. So the museum would be officially established in 1859. But Agassiz had been collecting specimens for years beforehand. And when it was first built in 1860, the museum was really crowded. There were tons of barrels, casks, boxes of specimens just overflowing. They're waiting to be cataloged and classified, you know, much less prepared to go on exhibit. Um, the overwhelming impression from early descriptions is also of a pretty smelly place. Um, Agassiz students used alcohol to preserve specimens. And they were counted coming home from a day of the museum smelling like the fish that they'd been handling all day. Um, William James, who would later become famous as a Harvard professor of psychology and for his pragmatist philosophy, um, actually worked at the museum as a young Harvard student. Um, and he wrote in a letter to his younger sister, Alice, um, this kind of very mysterious letter talking about, you know, working in the storeroom surrounded by, quote, monsters and horrors, you know, really playing up the mystery and strangeness of, of being surrounded by, by the collections of, of these glass jars. Um, and one thing I'd also note here, um, the, the overwhelming collections that really created a significant backlog for the museum. And so um, in the 1860s, um, they actually hired a number of women assistants in order to you know, do a lot of the work of cataloging, organizing, and labeling collections. Um, and these are the figures who I featured in the, the exhibit that Brenda mentioned in her introduction, um, focused on the early history of women workers here at the museum. Um, we can put a link in the chat and I'd be glad to chat more about that in the Q&A. A. So the goal of all this preservation was to allow extended time to examine and observe, to compare specimens, and to use these processes to draw larger conclusions about the relationships between different species. Thoreau was similarly interested in observing the natural world, but he drew on a variety of methods. Um, throughout his life, he collected an herbarium, geological specimens and arrowheads, um, and he also collected other forms of data. He recorded the first flowering of trees and the first appearance of birds in the spring in really extensive charts. 
Um, and the specimens that he donated to Agassiz and to the museum really offer an opportunity to think about the relationship between these different forms of observation. You know, as a naturalist, you know, Thoreau remained very self-consciously kind of on the boundaries of the professional scientific community and local institutions, but he also was very close with a number of Harvard professors of natural history and was very interested and deeply invested in the field. So Thoreau's donations to Harvard's collections extend back to 1847, while he was still living in his Walden cabin. A Harvard student wrote to him to ask for his help collecting bird's eggs, and Thoreau's reply, much like his remorse over the dead turtle, reveals his mixed feelings about the ethics of collecting. He wrote, quote, I confess to a little squeamishness on the score of robbing their nests, though I could easily go to the length of abstracting an egg or two gently now and then, and if the advancement of science obviously demanded it, might be carried even to the extreme of deliberate murder. So turtles were an especially vexed example of collecting practices for Thoreau because he really loved turtles. Um, he frequently writes about them in his journals. Um, he describes one day seeing a whole lineup of them, um, you know, their shells all next to each other, right? He writes, they're basking in the sun and he describes that it is a turtle day. Those are his words. So at another moment, he describes um, finding a broken shell that had been run over by a cart and turning it over and over again in order to observe its features and different parts. And here he's imagining not dissecting it, but rather putting it back together, much like the pieces of a puzzle. So to some degree, his donations to the MCZ and to other local collections like the Boston Society of Natural History, which was the precursor to the Museum of Science, um, these seem to have been motivated by his interest in these scientific institutions. Um, he was not particularly close with Agassiz himself. Um, Agassiz was very good friends with Thoreau's friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And so they seem to have met um, at Emerson's house for dinner a few times where they debated their, their contrasting theories of fish. Um, he also um, was very skeptical of Agassiz though, and his skepticism would only increase the more he was reading of Charles Darwin. Um, while he was, while he was providing specimens to the museum, he was paid, um, but the main compensation does seem to be this, this kind of contribution to a larger scientific project. Um, he occasionally visited the galleries of the Boston Society of Natural History, and in his journals, he recorded a lot of skepticism about natural history museums. He writes, I hate museums. There's nothing so much weighs upon my spirits. They are the catacombs of nature. They are dead nature collected by dead men. Would you have a dried specimen of a world or a pickled one? This kind of skepticism occurs elsewhere in his journals. He writes that he feels, quote, very ignorant in a museum. And he describes a walk among the preserved specimens um, saying, those jars of bloated creatures, which they label frogs, a total stranger, without the least froggy thought being suggested. Not one of them can croak. So museums posed a particular conceptual challenge to Thoreau's preferred methods for observing and recording natural phenomena. Although he clearly struggled with the ethical dilemma of killing animals, the specimens he donated to the MCZ offer a material record of how he was still very drawn to participating in the collecting practices of his local institutions. In questioning the kinds of information we get from museum objects, such as the turtle shell or the froggy thought, Thoreau also highlights the different ways that they can be valued and interpreted. You know, he justifies his collecting practices by, by looking to the advancement of science and the potential use of this object and its value to research. Um, but his reflections on preservation and loss also highlight the other kinds of information that can be gleaned, um, its imaginative potential, and also the unexpected ways that it could be reconsidered from a variety of perspectives. And in turn for us as museum goers, you know, we can read the specimen differently knowing the context in which it was collected and by placing it alongside his writings in Walden. You know, by bringing together some of these different perspectives and contexts, we can also think about the museum itself from a new vantage point and open up new possibilities for interpreting collections and raising questions about their value and purpose. So just by way of conclusion, I wanna come back to, you know, the, the larger, questions raised by natural by 19th century museums because in writing about the museums they were establishing the founders often used words like spark and collision you know they love to imagine these different objects and different fields of knowledge and perspectives being brought into conversation um, you know, throughout this period, the, the range of objects housed within museum cabinets and cases was, was really spurring many visitors to imagine continued possibilities for drawing new kinds of connections between them. 
But the founding of museums also set in motion, you know, much larger and, and still unresolved conversations about how we determine what to value and study and preserve. And these debates continue to this day as museums think about what it would look like to decolonize collections, engage broader audiences, and highlight underrepresented histories. So by considering how such questions were being discussed throughout the 19th century, we can also better understand the, the longer history of these debates and how they continue to inform the kinds of challenges facing museums today. And one thing I would just note is that I found in researching this project that the history of museums really requires an interdisciplinary approach, you know, because of the, the proximities between different objects and, and the wide ranging interests of a lot of collectors and institutions, we can actually better understand how museums were evolving if we keep a lot of those connections in mind. This approach allows us to acknowledge the forms of loss and erasure that occurred in making these institutions, but also to find new ways to, to highlight the voices of figures who were included in that conversation and to think about how we can connect museum collections across a variety of fields. So these issues really carry over to how we understand the role that museums can play today. So much like the transitional nature of the 19th century, you know, museums have been in a moment of crisis and transition, especially over the last 18 months. Um, but this also means that it's a very dynamic moment for thinking about how the priorities of institutions can continue to evolve and change, and about how museums can think creatively about interdisciplinary and inclusive forms of interpretation and education. Um, you know, much like the, the dried specimen of a world that Thoreau is talking about, you know, these conversations can really allow us to, to bring these objects to life in new ways. So thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with Brenda. Wow, Reed, as I've shared with you, um, your, your book um, and your presentation has this sort of uncanny um, ability to humanize um, both the, the sort of creation of museums um, and the cultivation of collections. And I especially appreciate the, the sort of interdisciplinary um, lens um, that it seems to be a, a clarion call uh, for reimagining um, the, the importance of museums. So thank you so much for, for your thoughtful um, and wonderful presentation. I'd like to kick off um, with, uh, with a question uh, that, that really centers on the very polyvocal approach um, that you employ uh, in useful objects. I mean, you use this really um, polyvocal approach to examining 19th century museums and their collections. And I wondered, um, in, in your opinion, why is it so important to understand museums from the various vantage points of the era's uh, visitors, writers, critics, and collectors? Well, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, and I think that's a that's a really great question and a really important one because you know I, I think that you you said it yourself exactly well, right? I mean, I think that you know taking this approach really does give us insight into the people who were using the collections, but also the people and stories behind individual objects. You know, I really think that taking this approach can help us think in new ways about how we understand and interpret objects. Um, you know, something might have been collected for one purpose a long time ago, but you know, another perspective might see it differently or raise you know new questions about its value or significance today too. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that really centering you know centering the people and the stories you know behind the museum and and within the collections is a way to to draw some of those connections out. Absolutely. I think one of the, um, you know, in, in, in exploring um, your book and hearing your, um, your presentation, uh, one of the other uh, things that I thought was the waves um, through which we understand history and thus the history of museums. Um, and you, you really uh, capture um, the, the waves, the discourses that shape the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So in particular, you posit the 18th century as pre-disciplinary, the 19th century as an era informed by the cabinets of curiosity, uh, and the 20th century as a period shaped by efforts to quote unquote decolonize museums. And so my question there is, why are these distinctions important and what do they signal or foreshadow regarding the future of the field? And who and what trends or discourses are shaping the field in the 21st century? 
Those are great questions. Those are really big questions too. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I may add to, um, you know, those breakdown in, in different periods too, is, you know, just like the early 20th century too, was such a, a major period in terms of how we think about, you know, the role of education, you know, the rise of, of interactive museum exhibits as well. And so I think that if we add that actually to that trajectory, that could be really useful for how we think about, you know, the moment that we're in right now. Um, you know, I think, I think it's a really great question. I mean, museums at the moment are, I think, really thinking a lot about the objects that they own, you know, in many cases reflecting on, you know, whether they still have the right to continue to own this object or that was acquired, you know, many centuries ago. Um, and I think that I really see a lot of museums moving towards acknowledging these aspects of their own history and kind of bringing that into how they interpret the collections today. Um, you know, and I also see that kind of playing out in, in a number of ways um, in terms of, you know, how acquisitions are, are proceeding, you know, how a lot of museums are looking to continue to build the collections, bringing in, you know, broader um, perspectives, bringing in um, more works by people of color, by women artists. Um, but, you know, I guess I, I would say I'm especially interested in the approach that, that is happening at the moment, you know, this really com community driven, um, community centered approach, um, the ways that issues of social justice and climate change, I think, are really being brought to the fore by a lot of museums. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, my own experience, I think, is primarily kind of within university collections like this one. Um, and I think that those are, they, those have been for me, and I think continue to be for many others, you know, really exciting sites for bringing together a lot of different cross-disciplinary perspectives on collections, um, you know, for thinking about objects um, and different connections between them in new ways, and also bringing students in the community into those conversations, you know, in, in part through events like this one, but also, you know, through the kinds of teaching that I and many of my colleagues are doing within the galleries. Awesome. And do you think, um, you know, if I'm if I'm thinking about the frameworks that you've um, leveraged in your research, would ethical stewardship be a defining feature of 21st century museum practice, in your opinion? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, because I think that that really comes, I think this idea of ethical stewardship and really, you know, reflecting on, you know, what the institution's purpose is, you know, what the mission is in terms of, you know, preserving, but also stewarding these collections um, really involves a lot of that, that kind of historical reckoning and acknowledgement, right? And so I think that that is really part of the, the conversations that are happening at the moment. Um, and I think that that's something that I would anticipate continuing in the future too. And my final question before I open the floor up to our amazing um, thread of questions um, from our attendees um, really is, is about why museums matter. Um, I've seen research that suggests um, that museums are trusted institutions, um, that, that people value museums. In your opinion, um, and given your expertise and research today, why, why do museums matter uh, to its uh, uh, to its visitors, um, to its observers, to its uh, to people that collect objects. Why, why does it matter in the 21st century? Well, another really wonderful question. Um, you know, I think about this a lot. Um, and I think about, I guess the way I approach this question is, is thinking about how we can use collections to think to, to tell new or maybe unexpected stories. Um, and I guess one, one example of this really is the, the exhibition that I, that I worked with HMSC on this past year um, on the early history of women workers. Um, you know, one thing I found in, in researching their stories, you know, many of these women worked at the museum for, you know, 50 years, but left very few, didn't leave much of a paper trail. You know, there, there were very few written records, um, but where we can find their stories actually is within the collections themselves. So, you know, we can look at these spiders or fossils or, you know, other, other you know, shell collections um, and see, see the legacy that they left behind. And, you know, I found that process to be, you know, that process really was reflective for me as well, because, you know, at one point, I think I was looking for a photograph of one of these women workers and really struggling to find one. And, you know, it made me really think in different ways about how these collections that have really functioned um, as, you know, primarily a scientific research purpose over the last century to century and a half, um, how they also can function as historical artifacts. You know, how can we see the you know, the spiders, the, the fossil specimens as, you know, records of the lives and careers and, and legacies of these figures. 
Um, and this is something I, I think about a lot in my, my research and teaching more broadly, um, because this, this is true, this pattern is true for a lot of historical figures. You know, not everyone is able to write things down. Um, and objects really allow us to access the lives and experiences of, of many different people who often were left out of, of dominant histories for a long time. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that thinking about collections in different ways um, can really help us open up a, a wide ranging conversation um, and highlight these, these kinds of stories. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is that, you know, in my teaching, um, you know, I, I sometimes ask students um, in an assignment to imagine how they could exhibit an object from one museum in a different museum, you know, what different kinds of questions would they ask, you know, how would they draw different connections to other objects in that collection. Um, and I guess I, I really see this as an invitation to, to just be thinking creatively about um, the kinds of stories we tell um, as a way of, you know, continuing to, to think about why, why museums are here and how they can contribute to, you know, these broader conversations that we're having. That's excellent, excellent response. Um, I'm going to turn my attention to the Q&A. There are some great questions here. I'll start with Catherine's question. Uh, she says, great talk. Can you talk a bit more about the history of changing access to museums? It is interesting that they were quite elite in many ways, but did they really change? If so, how or how not? That is such a great question. Um, so, you know, I think it's a big question because, you know, this, this process played out so differently at a number of different museums. So, you know, when I mentioned Ora White Hitchcock and her visits to, to museums in England and Scotland, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting is that in the 18th century, when these museums were being established, um, they only allowed visitors at like set times of day, like by appointment. Um, and, you know, the founders often felt that like the kinds of research that was happening with the objects was, you know, enough to fulfill the public mission of the museum, right? That this larger contribution to society was somehow equivalent to, to offering public access. Um, that shifted a lot during the 19th century. Um, but I think as your question points out, I mean, they, they were quite elite in many ways. Um, and, and I think this question of how much that has really changed is still really an ongoing one because, you know, a lot of the people who had access to museums in the 19th century, you know, tended to be elite white men, um, you know, to find accounts of, of women reflecting on their visits in the galleries um, can sometimes be more challenging. And as, that's especially the case for um, Black and Indigenous visitors to museums. Um, but I, I guess I'll offer just a couple of examples um, to, to think through that. Um, you know, one example is that in the, I think it was 1798, um, maybe 1796, um, there was a Native American delegation that was visiting Philadelphia as part of a diplomatic no negotiation with the federal government. And they actually visited Charles Wilson Peale's Philadelphia Museum, which was housed in Independence Hall at that time period. Um, and there are, there are all kinds of accounts from, from white visitors, um, onlookers to, the, to this visit, you know, reflecting on, on their presence within the galleries. Um, there's also a, a visual record of this visit and the silhouettes that were often created by Peel and his sons and also a black artist, Moses Williams, who worked at the museum. Um, they would create these as souvenirs for visitors to the gallery and they actually created a whole series of these for the, the Native American delegation. So these, these different records allow us to, you know, really emphasize the fact that Native American people were often present within these public spaces. Um, another example is, you know, that the black abolitionist William Wells Brown visited museums during the 19th century and often used this as an opportunity to um, really reinforce his own status um, and his abilities as a cultural critic, you know, to, to talk about the objects within the collections was to, to really highlight that for his, his readers. But finally, the last example I want to talk about um, is this short story that I find kind of I don't know. It's just a very funny short story. Um, it has a great title called Female Character, A Lesson, um, which just tells you everything you need to know. Um, but this is a really popular story that was reprinted across newspapers and magazines throughout the, the first half of the 19th century. Um, it tells the story of um, a young woman visiting the British Museum and misbehaving during her tour. She is insufficiently respectful to her tour guide um, and is scolded by one of the men on the tour for not paying close enough attention to what she sees. And so the story really stages her, her moral uh, development um, as she becomes better behaved. And then by the end of the story, she's the one like showing other visitors on the tour, you know, what things to look at. 
Um, and I think this is a just, I, I think the story itself is kind of funny, but I also just think that it's a great example of, you know, the, the kinds of patterns that you're talking about in terms of the elitism of these institutions, um, the kinds of hierarchies of authority and expertise that we're shaping, you know, who really feels welcome within those spaces, um, because I think that those those questions, um, you know, we're, we're kind of playing out in different ways and, and sometimes could be a little bit different depending on the institution um, in the past, but I think that that's still a question that the museums are, are navigating today. So thanks for the great question. Absolutely. You know, in building on that question, Emlyn um, has a, a, a really great question um, that, that looks at the changing landscape of museums as well. Emlyn writes, with museums having been defined by their collections in today's troubled world in which the future must grow out of the past and present, how do you feel about museums more so becoming civic spaces for reflective dialogue about pressing issues with curators and educators as discussants? I think that's great. Um, you know, and I, th I think that the more that the museums can really function as, as civic spaces, um, you know, the more I think that, that you can kind of move away from, from the kind of elitism mentioned in, in Catherine's question, right? Um, you know, I, I would also look to, to public libraries as, as a model for this as well. I mean, libraries aren't just, you know, collections of, of books at this point, you know, people are often using the, them as really important public spaces to um, to access all kinds of information and resources. And so, you know, I, I love the idea that the museums could could really function similarly. It's a great question. It's almost it almost suggests that, you know, museums shifting from this this these um, cabinets of curiosity to sites of courageous inquiry um, and where people aren't just um, looking, but they're also seeing the, the larger world or the larger community to which they belong. Um, so I really appreciate uh, your response to that question. Uh, with regards to technology, an anonymous attendee wondered, um, wanted to ask about how the new technologies are being implemented today in museum literacy. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I'm not sure if I can speak to, to the museum literacy side of this piece, but I guess one thing I would I would talk about is um, the role of new technology in terms of you know being able to create the the digital exhibit that I mentioned you know earlier in this presentation. So, you know one one thing I would say is just that that exhibition was initially planned to be a gallery exhibit. Um, we we planned on opening it I believe in the spring or summer of 2020. 2020 and that that maybe didn't happen. Um, and so what we decided to do is um, while the museum was still close to the public pivot to a, an online format. Um, and I think that to your question about the role of technology, you know, I think that I was really excited about that as a way for really opening up this project to, to more viewers and, and, you know, kind of remote visitors. Um, I think that it really allowed for, you know, a lot more um, conversation um, with, with people across fields. Like I heard from, you know, an arachnologist, you know, working on the history of women in his own field and who was able to access this, um, this information and access the exhibit and some of the, the objects and archives featured within it, um, because it because of technology. And so I think that, I'm not sure that this completely answers your question, but I, I do think that that, um, that that process really allowed for a kind of greater openness for the project and for, for the museum as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia uh, has a very uh, interesting question. She said, you spoke about early museums as being places that would lend objects to members. Do we know if the objects that these museums chose to lend were considered less valuable than objects that they did not lend, given the risk of damage and potential loss? Or were all <laughs> available for use in this manner? That is a really great question. Um, you know, to some extent, one of the challenges in fully answering that question is that the records aren't great of how objects were being loaned out. And in so, but in some ways, the fact that the records aren't great also answers your question, right? I mean, the one example that comes to mind is that I do know that they, the society was a little bit wary about loaning out scientific instruments because they were more valuable. You know, these had been purchased. They were, um, you know, they were often imported from Europe. And so they, they were a little bit uh, concerned about who, who was going to have access to those. But in terms of some of the other collections, you know, I, I do think that's a really interesting question. And I think um, my sense is that, 
Um, they tended to be loaned out depending on the areas of expertise of the people who were most interested in them. And by, by loaning them out, it was really an opportunity to, to try and generate more more you know, useful knowledge from, from these objects. Um, and so, you know, and I guess the, the other thing that I would say is, um, I didn't have time to get into this in the talk itself, but you know, these, the fact that there were these, these collections that you know, included a library, you know, a cabinet of natural and, and anthropological spec natural specimens and anthropological artifacts, um, you know, I think that was actually true for a lot of different um, institutions um, in the, the early 19th century, like just after the US was established, um, you know, here in Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Historical Society, American Antiquarian Society, um, Boston Athenaeum, you know, they had um, they had these collections as well, like within the library. And at some point in the mid 19th century, you know, a lot of these institutions decided that those collections were um, were, were just not going to be part of their institutional mission anymore. And a lot of those objects actually ended up here at Harvard at the Peabody Museum. And so, you know, we can actually trace some of some of the collections of the Peabody back to other institutions that collected them. And we can also see this this pattern of deaccession. So I feel like I've gotten a little bit away from, from your original question, but it, I, I do think that it's part of, you know, this process of thinking about your institutional mission, but I think it's exactly what you're asking about in terms of how are different kinds of, you know, knowledge and information being valued or, or thought about different, in different ways that, that relates to these patterns of loaning things out, but then also um, eventually um, deaccessioning or doing a kind of permanent loan of, of those collections. Wonderful. Um, I'm so delighted to, to see the sort of intergenerational um, audience that we have. We have a question from Emily Song. She says, hi, I'm a sophomore in high school. Do you have any book recommendations for the history of museums, perspectives on knowledge and access to education? Wow, that's a great question. Um, let me think. I kind of want to like, I just want to like turn around and look at my bookshelf. <laughs> You know, one book that comes to mind actually, um, and I actually just recently taught an excerpt from this in my museum studies course, but um, Lonnie Bunch, the, the current director of the Smithsonian, um, actually wrote a memoir a couple of years ago called A Fool's Errand, where he talks about the process of um, collecting um, objects for, for creating that institution. Um, it's very readable, but it's also, I think, really raises a number of great um, questions about um, you know, both the history of museums, but also just the process of, of creating that institution. So definitely would recommend that one. Awesome. Uh, another uh, question. Um, this one is a real broad one, and I, I, I love it because it can lend itself to a very rich uh, set of responses. How do you define museum? And what is the future for museums? That's from Gail. That's a great question. Um, you know, in large part because, you know, I think as I mentioned earlier in the talk, you know, I think the idea of what is a museum, um, in, especially in the time period that I'm looking at, is, you know, really shifting. You know, pe and people don't always use the term museum. Like sometimes they say cabinet, sometimes they say gallery, sometimes they say museum. Um, and, you know, and so I think that what is meant by that term is really shifting at this time. Um, in terms of how I would define it today, I mean, I think that, that that continues to hold true. You know, how do we think about the role of the physical space of the museum, the collection of a museum, especially as we kind of, you know, coming back to the, the question about technology, um, you know, the education and public programs mission, you know, how do we think about all of those, those different purposes, you know, within this term? And I guess I would say by, by looking back to, um, you know, some of these earlier conversations and seeing how this idea was, was very kind of transitional and, and kind of shifting around a lot at this time, um, we, can, we can maybe think more broadly about what, what we mean by it. And maybe we can, we can start to, to bring, bring more of these elements um, into conversation too. Thank you. Uh, building on that question um, in some ways, uh, Niels asks, how do you see the change from an orientation to the future by cabinets of curiosity during the age of discovery to an orientation to the lost past, which seems prevalent today? That's a great question. Like, I think that some of that maybe turns on this term curiosity, right? Because, you know, that's a, that's a, that's also, I think, a, a term that kind of like useful knowledge, um, you know, curious to whom, right? And so I think that this idea of sort of being, being oriented towards curiosity um, within, 
you know, within some of these early collections, you know, often that was in the, the eye of the collector, right? And so, you know, these, these cabinets were also kind of um, very much um, the product of colonialism, they're the product of global trade and exchange. And so, you know, the way that, that certain objects were classified as curious as opposed to um, others was I think really important to how we think about um, the relationship between, you know, that, that historical context of, of, you know, exploration as, um, being really important to how that, that term was really playing out. Um, and I also think that the, the reason I, I looked at that term also is that, you know, I think that that's also where, you know, curators and educators today are really kind of rethinking the way that, you know, the, these objects are described and interpreted, right? And so I think that as we, as we look to, to the past in order to, to think about um, these, these collections, these cabinets of curiosity, like we can, I think that, you know, often the way that we can contextualize these objects, the way that we can kind of bring in some of these multiple perspectives in order to, to think about how, you know, this idea of, of curious or curiosity is being negotiated also, I think, kind of lets us balance between, you know, the ways that these collections were thought about at the time and also how we can, can look at and, and reinterpret them today. Mm -hmm. um, Madeline asked um, a question. She said, great talk. How do you think um, uh, what is a, a good way a museum can get its visitors excited and interested in material culture in terms of exhibitions? That's such a great question um, and something that I think about a lot. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, I think it really depends. I mean, I think that compelling topics, um, you know, raising really important questions through the kinds of objects that you're you're bringing together that that often that can be resonant for for contemporary visitors um, that can be i think a really great way to get visitors excited um, is by really linking the objects that they're seeing to um, ongoing you know contemporary conversations but you know i guess the other thing i would say is that maybe it comes back to to brenda your initial question about you know kind of humanizing collections right like how do we really use these objects to to foreground you know people and stories um and i think that the the more that you can do that whether that's with you know a natural history specimen or with other kinds of artifacts or other kinds of material culture like that's i think that's often a way to really bring bring visitors in and, and get people kind of engaged in in these kinds of questions Mm -hmm. um, I, I have another a question from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, do you think museums and archives over collect today and thus can't adequately fulfill their agreements with donors and successful grant act and successfully grant access to their collections? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I would think back I guess I would think back a little bit to um, to some of these earlier examples and think about you know some of these collections that often were just sort of overflowing and often very overwhelming for visitors. You know I think that there's there's such a balance between you know what goes on display and what stays in storage. Um, and you know one thing that I have really loved in the last um, you know several years or so visiting museums that have visible storage. Um, I think that that is often a way to think about this question of how much you know, museums are collecting um, and, you know, what it looks like to, to fulfill those agreements, you know, what does it look like to display, um, you know, the process behind um, a museum collection, because I think that that sometimes, um, yeah, I think that sometimes, you know, being able to, to see the ways that objects are being preserved and housed um, can be uh, also a way of inviting visitors to, to reflect on how much a museum has that is not on display and also, you know, think through this, this question of, of over collecting and, um, and access to collections as well. Absolutely. And I think the, the leveraging digital spaces to actually expose um, materials um, that aren't on display or aren't being mobilized for in-person educational uses is another sort of that digitized um, collections is one way to, 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 to have that backlog uh, have raise its visibility uh, and access to, to visitors and online users. Uh, 
Some great questions here. Oh my goodness. Um, another great question from um, uh, Denise. Are there any communities, small or large in the world, that represent exceptions to the elitism that has governed most Western museums? Can you think of any landmark efforts in museum history to be widely inclusive? That's a great question. Um, I think about, I mean, I guess it sort of depends on, on how we, how, I think I think if we think about this question of, of landmark efforts, um, you know, the Smithsonian is, I think, a really, you know, important moment in, in that history, right? I mean, this idea of creating like a free and public museum. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, that's a really kind of, yeah, I think that's a really significant moment. Um, but I guess I would say kind of more broadly, you know, turning to, to what Brenda was just talking about with, with you know, digital access to collections, I think that that's a really landmark moment. Um, I actually think that that, um, that that turn, especially, you know, during during the pandemic towards virtual tours, virtual programming like that, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be curious, you know, how that continues to play out. But I think that that, you know, was a really important moment, as you were just pointing out for for giving access to collections, you know, for, you know, inviting a lot of people into the conversation, um, you know, in a number of museums, you know, including the Smithsonian, including, you know, some of the Harvard museums have created, you know, various kinds of tools for people to, to search databases to create kind of miniature um, exhibitions themselves, you know, and I think that that all of these different you know, strategies for engagement are, you know, really important to how we think about, you know, inclusion today. So, um, yeah, awesome. not sure that fully answers your question, but, um, <laughs> you know. Thank you for, for that thoughtful reply. Um, I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, the final one, um, I'll go to, to Mary's question. In the 1970s, the Museum of Comparative Zoology shifted from the cabinets world of curators to the laboratory world of scientists. Is this a time period of interest to you? The MCZ library also shifted from being open to all to being restricted to scholars only. Huh. That's a really interesting question. Um, it is definitely a time period of interest to me now um, that, I, that I know more about this and I'd be curious to really dig into this more. Um, you know, I think that's a, yeah, that's a really interesting way of thinking about that model, because I think that that, that really holds true for a lot of other kinds of museums as you move into the late 19th century, right, this idea that you're going to kind of, um, and um, Stephen Kahn has written a really wonderful book about, um, you know, museums and intellectual history at the, in the late 19th century, and actually talks about this kind of shift from, from the museum to the university in terms of, you know, where we, where we think about, you know, knowledge being produced. But, you know, I love how Mary has presented that in this question, in you know, this idea of the cabinet to the library, because I, or to the laboratory, because I think that that, you know, that really does capture, capture the kinds of institutional shifts that happen. And it also helps us think about, you know, where, you know, museums like this one actually fit into the university more broadly. So thank you. Awesome. Well, Reed, you have provided us with so much food for thought as the questions uh, in our thread uh, indicate. Thank you so much uh, for your time and your expertise and for giving us so much to, to think about as we explore the meaning of museums, uh, not only in the 19th century, but now. Um, so thank you so very much. Also, thank you to our audience. You've been captive um, and you've afforded us um, a range of excellent questions uh, to add to our Q&A this evening. Hope you'll join us for the next uh, program. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.